Okay, so good morning, everybody. Today we are going to start uh, uh, the topic on need findings. Uh, let me just remind you uh, about the labs um, for today and for the future, about the how, to, how to split okay, the different people in the two groups. So last week it didn't go too well because there were a huge amount of people in the first group and uh, only 15 or less uh, in the second group. And so it will be, it has been very difficult uh, to, to follow you uh, properly, okay? So uh, what we did for this week, uh, as you have probably read from the um, message by, by Luigi, uh, we put a cap on maximum 50 people uh, per turn, okay? Uh, per slot. Okay, so uh, I didn't check the, the numbers uh, today, just five minutes ago, but uh, if you still have, uh, I remember that the first slot was already nearly full. So if uh, uh, some of you still needs to uh, book their presence or they haven't booked and they just want to go, just go to the second uh, group, okay? Um, if there are more than 50 people, we will send somebody out uh, just to be able no, okay, to, to interact uh, properly with uh, um, each of you. From the next week, uh, it will be easier because after the submission of the group comp compositions, you have indicated uh, which slot you prefer. So we will take into account your preferences as a group. Uh, of course, we will solve any conflicts. So if too many groups uh, ask for the same slot, uh, we will be forced uh, to, to move them uh, in the other one. And uh, we will give the assignment of the groups uh, to the first or second slot for the rest of the year. Uh, so that it's easier, you don't have to, let's say, uh, every week uh, try to book uh, what you prefer. You already know uh, for the rest of the course uh, when uh, you have to come. Hmm? And so we try to have it more balanced so that we can assist you better in your work. Okay, so we just ask him for your collaboration you know, to try to keep the things balanced. Okay, so let's. Uh, sorry, this is not. Uh, let's start this new topic, uh, which is the starting point uh, of our projects uh, about uh, this need finding phase. Need finding is a shortcut word, okay, that stands for understanding the user needs, so what the user needs, and as a consequence, what should be the requirement for the system, okay? So the requirements of the system don't, uh, are not created by a technical team, but they are created, they should be created by the analysis of the needs uh, of users, uh, needs, uh, not uh, wants uh, or desires, okay? Uh, and we'll see this. Hmm? And uh, this, so we should plan at the beginning of the project a phase uh, that is called uh, need finding, and we will learn some of the tools today and tomorrow, some of the tools that are used uh, during need finding. Actually, this is part uh, of a process uh, that should in some, in some way you know, drive the development uh, of our project. Uh, in the last slides uh, that I skipped uh, in the previous week, uh, uh, we had some overview of different uh, software development processes. And one of the questions that we didn't mention was, uh, if I have a software development process, how do I fit human-computer interaction and usability inside that project. So the, the short answer, I'm not going to, opening, to open the boring slide, the short answer is uh, first try to include the users in all the steps of the development, and in the course we'll try to see some tools for doing that, some methods for doing that, and second, uh, usability or human computer interaction should always uh, come before any other step. So before 
defining the specification, check with the user. After the, the specification, before starting the design, check with the user. After designing, before starting implementation, check with the users and so on. Before designing the layout and the graphics of the interface, check with the users. Before committing to the final high, let's say high quality graphical aspects, check with the users and so on. So at different points in the development projects, we always have to check so that at every step, we should be confident enough that we are building an application that will satisfy the user needs in the way that the user would like it. Or like, maybe it's not the correct word, in the way that the user will feel confident and efficient about that. Okay? Of course, in the different steps, we need different techniques. Uh, for defining the system requirements, uh, we need to work uh, with a user without any existing system. Uh, after we designed uh, probably a sketch of the interface, uh, we already have that sketch and before the implementation of the colors and the graphic and the layout and the fonts, all the details, we could interact with the users by playing, by experimenting the sketch. So at the different stages of the project, we have different techniques that we can use to extract information from the user. Okay? So we are, our job is always to try to anticipate from the, say, launch of the product, from the market, marketing date of the product, where we actually will discover the reaction of our users, whether something is good or not, if we are careful enough to observe and to listen to the user, which is not always true. But we should try to get most of the information that we would discover after product launch, we try to discover it months ahead of time okay, during the development process so that we can get it right the first time instead of having something that we should reconsider. Okay? So this is our game. So at every design step, before going forward with the next design step that will take maybe one or two or three months of development of a staff of people programming, let's sit for two days and ask ourselves, is there anything that we have to adjust? Hmm? Is there any result of the previous step uh, that would create, could create later problems with the users? And so let's try to adjust it before investing in a lot of, the, of development time. So this is the philosophy. At different moments in the development process, stop, not for one week, for two or three days, or one day maybe, we'll see that the techniques uh, that we are going to, to, uh, to use together are very simple. They don't require a lot of investment time. Of course, because the, the wheel cannot be stopped. We have some deadlines, we have some project duration, so you cannot delay the project because you need to do usability. Actually, what we try to do is to reduce the reworking, reduce the errors, reduce the correction that we have to do later on by spending a few days strategically, okay, in this topic. And so, uh, in this, so whatever your process is, it's a waterfall process, it's an agile process and so on, whenever you are starting to do some technical work or some design work, always stop and say, okay, Let's check with the user. Hmm? Maybe you just need two people or three for half an hour to have a look at what you did. With the proper techniques, uh, you get a lot of information. Okay? And uh, a simple, let's say, representation of this process is starting from, this is, uh, of course, a simplified waterfall, starting from what is wanted, we analyze the system requirements, so we design a solution and we build uh, the system. And broadly, okay, these are the broad steps uh, in every software development process. 
And uh, at every step, there are techniques uh, that are written here around uh, the boxes. Techniques that are de be developed in the ACI field that will help you at that stage of the project. Okay? Uh, so, in the phase where we define the requirements, uh, these are the techniques that we are going to see. When we are translating the requirements into detailed analysis of how to uh, describe these requirements uh, and what function we need, uh, there are other techniques for, for representing them, for studying them, for checking them, and so on. Okay? We are not going to see all of these hmm, techniques. And just to give you an idea that there are, of course, different techniques because in different stages of development, of development, the information that you have, the project that you have, is, of course, of, course, of a different nature. And <clears throat> another very important artifact that deserves its own box is trying always to work with prototypes. Okay? This is something that we as a teachers are never tired of repeating. No? I always tell to the students of the first year, you are crazy if you think that you can write 20 lines of code and only then run it. You should try to run it after five lines of code and, say, and go, okay, you know that because you already had a lot of pain through the years. Um, and this is the same here. Even for larger systems, always have a smaller version, a simpler version, a toy version to experiment. The additional criteria that we are adding in this course is that this prototype should be designed for user testing. Okay? It's a prototype of the interface for checking whether the interface is okay or whether the, the flow of operation of a system is okay. You don't need to have a database. You don't need to have a a real website, uh, you just maybe some, some screenshot, or not even screenshot, just drawing, or not even drawing, just sketches. Hmm? So this concept of a prototype is something which is very flexible, and it always refers to a preliminary version of the functionality of the final system for the purpose of investigating some usability aspect to this. So building the prototype is one of the tasks that you would be, you would build anything, uh, sorry, anyway, just for testing, for development, for partitioning the work. Now we are, you are using this also for usability checking and usability design with some, of course, techniques that will, not just looking at the pages, say, okay, this is nice, hmm? but, uh, having techniques for extracting from the user the understanding whether this interface is okay with them. Okay, but we'll come to that. For now, we are focusing on the first step. Okay, so we are trying to answer the question, what do we want to build? No, it's not what do we want. What does the user really want? And what the user really wants is not really what the user thinks they want. So uh, we need to find or to discover user needs. What do the users really need or want? This want is very is, is dangerous, okay? I prefer to use needs instead of want. Because many times the user don't know what they want. They think they want something, but in fact they don't. Hmm? Um, I, I just tell a very short story. Once uh, uh, we were working with a project uh, with uh, energy management, uh, uh, IoT systems for energy monitoring, management, and so on that kind of stuff. And uh, we were involved with some group of uh, energy managers. You know that every firm, every company should have an energy manager person which is responsible for the management of energy and, uh, okay. And 
we knew that we had a, a lot of data, a lot of sensors, a lot of actuation, a lot of automation that we could build, okay? And so we asked, that we did a mistake of asking to this group of energy managers, but if you had a very advanced uh, computer system for managing everything in your building, what would you want to do? And uh, I think the main answer was, I'd like to be able to export the data into Excel, okay? But this is normal. Our mistake, my mistake. People that are doing the job of the energy manager are energy engineers, mechanical engineers, physicists, or whatever. We cannot expect that the person which is the expert in their domain could understand the potential of, an, of the ICT technology, huh? so that we can build some interactive dashboard, you can build some real-time alerts, so you can build some data analysis and so on. This is our job as a computer scientist, to devise what we can do. Hmm? On the other hand, we have an expert of that domain, and he cannot speak to me telling me the specification of what I need to do, because they don't know enough my field. Hmm? And this is a general rule. So we need to understand the users and understand what they want and try to understand what they want without explicitly asking for that. Hmm? Because they won't be able. And of course, the first step is identifying the users. Identifying, and this is also a suggestion for your project, identifying very well who are the users. It's not any user. We should pick a very specific, narrow set of persons so that you can analyze the needs of that group. And these people didn't come from Mars uh, or from Jupiter yesterday. They are here, and today they are already doing something with that. So your idea is helping people, I don't know, in, in planning their activities, their, I don't know, workout activities in the gym, whatever. Okay, but today they are doing the same job without your system, without your application. So let's first learn how they are doing that specific job now. And only by seeing how they are doing this job now and seeing their problems, where, where there are issues, where there are some difficulties, only then we can try to propose a solution. And we won't propose a solution for some steps that are already working well for them. And there's no need of forcing them to use an app uh, for something that they already are doing very well. They don't feel the need. It would be only slower. Okay? Many systems, especially in intranet environments or in enterprise environments, they build a system not to help the workers, but so that the managers have the control and have the data about what the employees are doing. So it doesn't really satisfy a need of the employees. It satisfies the ego of the managers in many cases, okay? Or the, to help the work of the who, those who do reporting and so on. But there are an extra step, an extra work, an unwelcome work for the employees. So let's not fall into this trap. Hmm? What is the context in which they are doing this job? Is it something that they do at home? Is it something that they do on the road? Is it something that they do in the office? And uh, how many other things they are doing at the same time? And uh, who are the people that are around them? Hmm? We should understand how this job, this activity, fits uh, into their context, into the daily context, if we want to be able to help them. Many project that they saw failed miserably, for example, for example, computer medicine, huh? where you develop some software for 
tracking the patients in the hospitals, the, the, the drugs that you submit, you administer, the exams of the people, and so on. And you cannot think of a nurse going around in a hospital with a laptop, okay? They, they tried that, it, of course it failed, okay? Because first, the, 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 the climate, the, the environment, the context in the hospital is very crazy, frenzy. They have to run here and there, there are emergencies and so on. Oh, let me shut down the, the laptop. No, the people is, not, it comes first. And then these workers need their hands. They're doing the work with the hands, so they cannot hold the laptop, or not even a, a tablet. The hand is needed for assisting the patient, for example. So just imagining that they should handle a device is something that should stop you at the beginning if you think about the user. Okay? So this is something that you learn with experience. But if you stop and think about how these users are working, uh, you can find or try to find some, exclude some solution and work on others. Okay? Can we just ask them no? Hmm? I think it's clear that it's not, uh, you cannot take a, a shortcut. We should get to know our system. So the guru right there on the mountain, if we go to them and say, okay, but how can I build a good system? First, the first role is know, get to know your users. Who are the users? Is the system designed for satisfying a single group of users? Or there are several groups of users with different responsibilities? No. Uh, system for scoring the exams, okay? For giving you the grades after the, the marks. I never know if, whether you score or mark or grade, so I use all the words in the same sentence. The final mark of your exam. So there's a system where the teacher should enter the mark and the student should see them. So there are at least two different groups of uh, users that are served by the system and they need to see and to operate different functionalities, okay? It would be much nicer if each of you could give themselves, in a sense, a grade. Hmm? It would save me a lot of work. Just give yourself 30. Uh, it doesn't work like this. So the, a group of users, another group of users, they both need to use the same system, but they have different needs, different requirements, different context. Okay, when I load in the grades, probably I'm in my office or at home, when you're seeing them, you are everywhere, because maybe it comes at a random type, uh, the time, the, the, the scary mail, uh, you have a new, or in your provisional scores uh, section. And so wherever you are at the cinema, you just open something, and so you don't need to go through too many pages or logins or something like that because you are out of context. So understanding, very simple system. You have two groups of users. But for the design point of view, each of them has different needs. Uh, you cannot just design a system for the needs of one group by ignoring the other. So first, uh, Identify the different groups of users that are uniform, that have uniform needs, and identify which are these groups. And uh, within, within each group, you try to understand them better. Are they young people? Are they old? Are they novice uh, from the point of view of, uh, let's say, digital skills, or are they experienced? Are they novice from the point of view of the domain knowledge or the experience, like, I don't know, the energy managers, is this a, is a person, a new energy manager, so he needs to be guided, he doesn't know a lot of details about his own work, or is a person that is 20 years is doing that, and so he doesn't need to be guided through, maybe he needs more power functionality. So, are these groups uniform or should we split them? Should we have an interface for the novice and one for the experts or an interface that blends from novice to experts? It's something that will be part of our design. At this stage, 
we must be able to recognize the grouping or the profiles okay, of our target users. Never think, don't do the mistake of thinking of a generic user, a student. No, a student. You have an Italian student, you have an international student, you have a, a bachelor student, you have a master's student, you have a, a, an architecture student, and a computer engineering student. There are different type of animals. Hmm? And we should, in a way, consider that. For some tasks, they are uniform. For the other tasks, they may be different. Hmm? So, always ask ourselves, is this description enough to qualify the group of users, or should I split? But the general rule is that you, or me, are never a user. You say, but I am a student, so my needs are the same as the student, as needs of other students. No. Don't fall, this is the biggest trap that we have. Imagining that what we think can be generalized to what the potential user of our systems would need. They can be generalized first because uh, if each person is an individual, if, even if you are student, each, if I would interview each of you individually, you have your preferences, you have your desires, you have your priorities. So you cannot project your own view into everybody's. And then if you know that you are developing a system, you are immediately seeing the system from a different point of view. This is a chair, of course, but if I'm the designer of this chair, I would see in this chair totally different attributes compared to just being a user of the chair. Okay? Does it break when I'm sitting? Is it comfortable? The seat or more or less, or maybe the aesthetics. And, but if I have to build it, I would need to care about a lot of other stuff. And they cannot clear my mind from how many pieces will it be, how do I transport it, how do I assemble it, and so on. Are they stackable or whatever? Because it will be part of my job. I cannot just clear my mind and pretend I'm a, I'm a user. Okay? When you're buying a computer, you always think about what you're doing with it. So, listen to everybody except yourself in understanding the users. By chance, you may be a part of the group, but just pretend you are not. Okay? So, uh, about students, about young people, okay, all students, all young people in the world except me. And also if you are developing something for a cl client or a customer, usually the direct client is not a user. Hmm? Maybe it's a person from marketing, maybe it's a person from management, maybe it's a project manager or whatever but it's not a direct user. So you hear this sentence many times, I know what my employees need. No, you don't. I need a system so that my employees can enter the data faster and quicker. Okay, step aside, let me talk to the employees to understand what their job is. But I know, no, you don't. Every time you have to play this game. Trying to get to the real users and not to anybody who pretends to know what the real users are doing every day. No boss ever knows what their employees are doing. They don't know. They pretend to know, but in the, in the detail, they don't. Hmm? So, we should always try to go to the actual users that will use the system or potential future users, okay? These are the only ones who have the knowledge to make 
to enable us to make a better system for them. And of course, there would be, for example, if we have different groups uh, of users, <laughs> we, should, we need to be careful, okay? We need to find trade-offs. Something that would satisfy one group uh, maybe would create some problems from, from another group. Okay, we are the designers of the system. We have the responsibility of making choices. So the uh, ultimate choice is with us always but we should make an informed choice we know explicitly that if we are choosing this we are solving a problem for one group of user and maybe creating an issue from another group of user we evaluate we judge we decide with their information not with my information and uh, how do i know how do i know what you need and what you are doing. Oh, it's easy, okay? I just talk to you or I watch you. Talking, especially listening, and observing are two basic tasks. You enable us to get the information that we need. Of course, there are methods that are structured ways of talking do an interview, do a survey, do a focus group, and something like that. Or there are techniques for observation. Hmm? We will see some of them, some of the techniques that are mentioned here. Okay, so we should plan for the first stage of finding some users, group, identifying the classes of users, finding some representative people in each of these groups, and have some observation or some dialogue with them. Oh, I'm not talking about three months of work. I'm talking about two days hmm? or even less. So all the, these techniques tend to be very cheap, let's say, in terms of time. Hmm? They should be. And uh, talking and watching are complementary ways of extracting information. Talking is more on the rational level, watching is more on the intuitive level. So you, uh, did it ever happen to you of uh, working with your friend, uh, maybe just writing a document, uh, a word or a PowerPoint together, no? and you need to you know, move a paragraph or change some style, and your friend always uses a different key sequence from you. A different method. Maybe you cut and paste and delete, and maybe you drag and the other person using the menus, the other person using the right click, and the other person using the keyboard, or whatever. Everyone is doing some task in a different way. And that's okay. But until you observe them, you don't notice it. Hmm? Maybe you are getting angry. It happens sometimes. No, no, don't do that. In that way, it's quicker. I know a quicker way. Yeah, okay. You can give a suggestion, but uh, um, up to today, those people found their way of doing their work. Maybe it's not the most efficient, but it works for them. And so we should analyze not just in which way I should do this, I could do this task abstractly, like how to move a paragraph but in which way the users are today doing that task, and you may find surprises. You may find that maybe something that the user, where the user finds issues or problems or is very slow, is because they are not using the right procedure. There's a much faster way. They just don't know it. And if they don't know it, if they don't know that it's a faster way, the fault is not theirs. Okay, the fault is of the system that doesn't show them the right icon, the right command in the right place at the right time for them to discover. So in many cases, you find that the problems are not what we think. We, we, are, we are nerds. We always think about strange uh, and advanced stuff. The users many times only need simple stuff, but it should be the right simple stuff. 
Um, and if the user does something strange or unexpected, just ask why. And you will discover a world of possibilities. That the user may be think that they are doing something in this way because the system otherwise would, which is totally wrong probably. You may discover that the user are taking strange routes because they have a wrong mental model of the system. And again, if the user have a wrong mental model of the system, it's the system's fault. This is our mantra. When everything else fails, you can imagine users, probably. So if I were to develop uh, an interface for flying to Mars, it's very difficult to find people who are actually today flying to Mars to interview. And so probably maybe you can find uh, some users that are, you know, flying helicopters or something similar and try to start from there. If you want to build an application for billionaires, I hope you have a lot of billionaire friends. I, uh, I hope you have a lot of billionaire friends. But if it's not the case, uh, maybe you play with something, some alternative. So you should be creative in some way, okay? When a real user is not available, we should try to find proxies, so users that are similar experiences, maybe in different fields, or just imagine people, there's a technique, we are not going to into detail about this, of personas, okay? So you create, like you're writing a, a novel, okay? You imagine a person, and after a while, if you have creative writers, or if you know some creative writers, after a while, these writers say that uh, their characters create their own stories. Because they, I say, they imagine these people, these characters, so well that they start, you know, the writer knows what the character is thinking, and the, the character takes a life of their own. So when you imagine a person and you give enough characteristic about this person, uh, then you can probably imagine what they're going to do. Of course, with a very wide degree of approximation, but it's better than nothing. Okay? You will make a lot of imaginary friends and interview these imaginary friends about what they're doing. Of course, it's better if you do this in a group, in a team, so that everybody can offer their point of view instead of just splitting your consciousness across five different people. Hmm? So, but there are techniques. This is just, these two slides are just to point you forward, saying, okay, there are different techniques for the different aspects. Each of them has been studied. And studied. There are methods, okay, that we can and should adopt. Uh, this is the list of the methods that we are going to discuss in this in this week, basically, uh, that are suitable for different moments. Okay, and some of these will be part of the next uh, next week's uh, lab, where we ask you, we'll be asking you to do some neat finding about your choice. Okay, so the first techniques uh, are the simpler ones, observation. Okay, and this. This is a very good synthesis. You cannot observe a lot just by watching. Hmm? And uh, it's true. But you need to set yourself in the mood of watching and taking notes and of uh, okay, reasoning about what you see. This is called, uh, these observation techniques uh, are in, in some way derived from ethnographic observation. You know, ethnography is where people start and go to the very far lands in Africa or whatever and find some tribes that never had contact with the civilization or whatever and try to see how they work, what are their values, what are their uh, habits, and so on. Okay? So when you go there and observe this tribe, you try to interfere as little as, little as possible with them so that you can get uh, what is their normal way of life. Hmm? And uh, we do the same, trying to approach the tribes that correspond to the, our user groups that we defined before. Okay? 
and uh, try to obtain from these groups uh, the, the information that you need uh, and we need the, inter the information to design the interface or to redesign the interface, of course, without interfering, without changing how they behave. Uh, we should uh, learn the language of the user, so understand how they're speaking, what the, what's the meaning of their words, so that we can also use the same words and the same concept in our interface. Uh, talking about uh, the Polytechnic, for example, there is a very uncomfortable choice that we made, somebody made, uh, when you're taking a course like today and you're speaking among yourself, you use the word course or corso in Italian. Uh, but the official word in, 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 uh, say in the bureaucracy of Politecnico is insegnamento, hmm? which doesn't have any translation in English, sorry. And there's an official glossary that says that uh, insegnamento in English would be course. <laughs> uh, but for, uh, let's say, bureauc bureaucratical reasons, we have to use different terms because course is also corso di laurea, the degree. And so the same word cannot be used for two different concepts, the degree or the individual course. And so there are some term terminology that if I'm speaking with the people from the student office, we need to use this terminology to understand ourselves. But if I'm talking with students, maybe we're a prospective student, a foreign student or whatever, if I'm using the official, let's say, bureaucracy language, they won't understand. Okay? And if I'm building an interface, the interface should speak the language of the user. And if I have different users, maybe these languages are different. Okay, it's a complexity for me. But it should not be a complexity for the user. So the use of terms, the use of language is important and we should try to adapt uh, to the, to the uh, let's say, customs, to what the people are accustomed already. And in the environment where they're working, what, what they're doing. And the observation usually is trying to just sitting there and observing and listening. Maybe sometimes uh, asking questions if, you, if there's some behavior you don't understand. That is. So you don't ask for changing their behavior, but you're asking for understanding some behavior, some choice, or some actions that they're doing. When possible, it's not always possible, but when it's possible, you could uh, record what you're seeing video recording, audio recording, not for posting on Facebook, but just for reviewing it later in case you miss some detail. Hmm? Um, because your attention is just uh, limited. If you can rewatch it, uh, you can find more details. And of course, uh, you can, one thing is observing, and the other thing is understanding what you are observing. And when you try to understand, you're also always interpreting what you're seeing with your experience, with your cultural background, okay? Just to make an example, if you see some behavior in some animals, you know, an animal that kills another or whatever, we try to interpret what we see with our system of values, which is totally wrong, of course, or totally different. From, well, from theirs, okay? So also for the users, we should be always, always be careful of avoiding excessive interpretation of what we see from our point of view. The other risk is, of course, disrupting normal practice because always when somebody is watched, they behave differently. Always. If somebody's watching you, you won't behave in the same way. So we should try to minimize the fact it cannot be okay, uh, avoided completely. And of course, uh, there may be some important information that you miss uh, in a 
because you are, you are just human. <laughs> you cannot get everything, especially something strange to you. So it's, uh, you need to be careful. And uh, if we do that, so we, we see some techniques for doing that. Actually, what are the questions that we should ask ourselves? Okay, in the observation, I tend to interact as little as, pos as, little as possible with the users, but I'm asking myself some questions about what, do we, what did I learn from this observation set? Uh, I'm trying to learn what people are doing, what goals they have, the goals are why they are doing stuff. Uh, and how the single task interacts with the, this is a strange word in a larger ecology, let's say in the daily activity, the whole of the daily activities. So is that that person doing the same task over and over again? Are they mixing different types of activities? How are doing that? How each of them fits with the other and so on? and see whether you can spot some similarity or differences among the different people that maybe are doing the same tasks. Or if the behavior is different, uh, depending on you know, the time of the day, for example. Okay, it's nearly lunch, so I won't start this task before lunchtime because I know it's long or it may create problems. Or I don't, I'm not starting this at five in the evening because I know the support is not... Uh, Close. So if I have problems, I I just I will just wait waste time. Or don't don't go in production on Fridays, which is a an important rule for computer engineers. Or don't change uh, routing tables on Monday like Facebook did uh, yesterday. Um, but okay, this there may be some tacit knowledge. Lead people do it, do different stuff at different times. Uh, I remember one project from the last years uh, that, that worked on, with some of the restaurants, uh, bars uh, here uh, around for lunch break for students. Okay, and actually, a student when it goes to order a sandwich or whatever behaves differently whether. They are maybe half an hour in advance, so I'm planning for later, or I need to go there and have sandwich in five minutes. And so the, the process you have is totally different. Okay? From one side, you, if you are there, you, you value the speed. Just give me what you have. If you are planning, you value the choice. Very stupid example, but... Uh, not stupid, but simple. It can translate. So these details, uh, if we are not winning the, the Nobel Prize for discovering these things, okay? But we are just spending some time in analyzing and learning to think how the user behaves. And this knowledge will be gold when we uh, will design the system. And a very important observation is how to compare process and practice. Okay, the strange words that basically compare how in theory things should be done or are designed to be done compared to how they are actually done. By the people that do them every day. Because when you are trying to do something, you can imagine it can be done by the book, okay? There's a system, it's, uh, it's a procedure with five steps, and then you go to step one, two, three, four, five, and so on. By the book. If you read the manual, or if you interview who built the system or whatever. And then you go and observe the people using the same system, and you see they didn't they don't really or necessarily use it in the official way. Because maybe in step three, they need to enter, I don't know, a password 
that they don't remember. And so before step one, they already open a document where, where the password is stored, so they can cut and paste, for example. They need to switch between two different applications while they are using the system. Because the system requires some information that they have in another program. They have to copy some data by hand, or can they do it, or will they cut, cut and paste? Will the system allow it? Um, how many times, uh, stupid things, uh, you, you have a group of friends uh, and you need to decide when to go to take a beer together? Okay, oh, okay. for me it's okay, it's Tuesday or Wednesday at six uh, or maybe even at five, but only on Thursday. And a lot of the other replies, yes, also for me. So you have 27 different messages where people check the messages and check their agendas. Okay, and at the end it's very difficult to, this is a, com a complex process for a simple task, okay? Yeah, they, they invented Doodle. I didn't want to go to Doodle to the first because they say, okay, it's easy, you are just four friends uh, for a beer. Hmm? And you find it's not so simple. But just imagine the different task switches that you have between different applications. And information, everybody is writing information in a different way. And so just uh, parsing, so the, usually there is one person in the group that tries to take, to, takes a piece of paper and tries to draw a table, say, okay, where is, where is, when is everybody free? Okay. And so, um, if you check any calendar application, you usually get it wrong. Because it assumes that every information is already in the calendar. You, check the, you, have, you select the people and it will tell you when all the people are free. But actually people may be not really free, but they are traveling or they know that half an hour they should be somewhere else. And they, don't, they, don't book, uh, they didn't book the time in their agenda. So officially there are very clean procedures for checking a meeting. In practice, it's a total mess. Just to make an example. Okay? So it's very important that we learn the tricks uh, because those are the places where we can improve the process. Hmm? For example, where the people have problems, have needs, uh, they won't tell you because for them it's normal. It's normal practice doing that. They see no other way around that. Maybe you can see it, or we can see it because we are designing something new that they, they didn't think about. Um, there are different types of observation depending on where uh, you are uh, planning to do that. For example, these two basic, basic uh, different, the, the controlled observation and the so-called naturalistic observation. Okay? Controlled observation is easier for, for the experimental person. We bring people here in our lab and let them do the task. And uh, we observe them. So people are outside their natural environment. They are not at home or in the office or in the gym or wherever. They come here in the lab and we try to re rebuild a corner of the lab that looks like their kitchen, their gym, their whatever the office whatever the space or the context is where the activity should be done. It's, uh, it helps the analysis of the data because then every person will do the task in the same exact environment. So it's very easy for us to compare what people did, what is their efficiency, what are the problems. Also, from a quantitative point of view, we can count how many people found problems or not. And it's also quick for us because we are already in our lab. We uh, you know, call people and uh, for each of them we just spend half an hour for doing the experimentation. We give them some money, thanks them, and okay, on the next one we go. Um, of course, uh, the people that are going to do a task in our lab, 
will not be as natural as doing the, the same task on their own or in their no normal environment. Okay, so there will be an effect about, an effect on their behavior by the context and by the observer, by knowing they are, are observed. Okay, if you bring a person and say, okay, eat this uh, piece of cake, and they are served with cameras, they will eat it very you know, politely. In their own home, maybe they are just uh, rushing through the throat or with their hands or whatever. Hmm? Just to remember. The alternative is going where the users are, which of course is possible, it will be better, we get more quality uh, of the observation. We are observing the real thing and not just a surrogate. And uh, we can see the people in their context and so we see actually what do they have on their desk, under the desk, in their bag or whatever. So maybe you find that there are some objects, some artifacts, some information, some printouts that they are using. They have two screens, they have one. And this can give you, give us more information hmm, about how they are doing their activities. And may also stimulate new ideas. I didn't think that somebody could have a printout of the comments, or I didn't think this task is faster with two screens and so on. Okay? But we discover because we see many different uh, environments uh, in which the same task is done. We need to visit them. We waste much more time because we have to go there and set up our recording and so on and then go back home, save everything and go to the next user and so on. But we get more information. Of course, uh, every person that we observe will be different. So there will not be a standardized setup. Every observation will be, of course, we will extract more qualitative information. We cannot make a statistics because people maybe are in a different setup and it's normal. Hmm? Um, so we are more variability, more ideas and less uh, replicability, which may be good hmm? because it gives us a larger space, a larger design space, okay? A larger space of alternatives to think uh, for decided what the system would do. And, uh, okay, it's hard to manipulate external variables so that you are, you are constrained by the characteristic of the space where you are going, okay, if it's raining or if there's a lot of people there, that will be a very noisy. Uh, in another office, it will be very quiet uh, and it's not something you can control. So you need to be flexible, you need to adapt. Uh, just remember, in all of these observation tasks, uh, we are observing the users doing their current task. We are, not already, we are not yet telling them what our system will do. We are trying just to understand how they are solving their problem in the same domain where we, are want, where we want to create our, own, our application, our project. We still don't know what our project will do. You should not go into observation or into need finding with already some feature of the system in mind. Because then you will only see a very narrow part of what they're doing because you are filtering, you are trying to confirm that the feature you had in mind is okay. So everything will be useless. And this is very difficult for us and for you. Thinking only for, for four weeks, three or four weeks, only thinking about the users and their tasks without thinking about the features of our project. We, we, we want the user to tell them to us or to discover them from the user, not to have them in mind. 
This is the most difficult phase. I just had a discussion yesterday with an engineer that said, I think this can be, I can do this. It started like that. I can change this feature in this way. And after a long discussion, I give him, why? Does everybody need it? Ah, yes, some user asked me for it. Yes, but why do they ask it? Why did they want it? What is the problem they were trying to solve? And the discussion didn't go well because the final uh, message was, ah, but I think I will do it because it's easy. Not because it's useful. Not because they required it, or I don't care if they require me something. I want to know what is the problem that people are trying to solve, because I can find a solution which is better than what they are requiring me now. So it really, it's very difficult, especially for people like us working on, on design, implementation, programming, of making a step back, not thinking about what I'm going to implement, uh, but thinking about what problem I'm, I'm trying to solve for the user, what user's problem. One technique uh, for, uh, for coming back to observation, you have two choices, okay? for blending in. So the idea is trying to observe without disrupting too much, okay? Being sure, as sure as possible, that what, you're, what, uh, what you are observing is the real behavior. It is not influenced too much by your presence. So one possibility is to become in part of the world. Okay, so you sit in a corner. Sorry, I cannot be too faint. Uh, and uh, you hope that the people will forget about your presence soon enough. They will go on their task and they forget that some, some, some person there which is you know, behind the, the jacket or just hiding. Uh, so in this case, you try to not interact be part of the furniture, okay? You, you shouldn't hide, of course, because it's illegal to observe something from hiding, but you should be present, but uh, just people after a while just tend to treat you as a part of the wall, okay? And so well, they will try more or less, they will more or less resume their normal behavior. Okay? And so if you have some question for them, if you see something that you should really understand better, you cannot inter interrupt them on the spot because then it will break your role as a part of the world. You take notes, and at the end of the day, at the end of observation, you just go to these people and say, okay, at the moment I saw you do this action. I saw you put away this computer and go to another one, whatever. Why did you do that? Can you explain me? I want to understand better. The goal is understanding, not blaming, of course. If they did something, it was right for them. Just let me understand why, because they didn't respect it. Okay? So there's an observation period which is as secluded as possible, and an interaction, a discussion period which is after that. Or the alternative, the alternative would be try to become one of them. Okay? Let's be part of your group for three days. I will sit with you. I will go to the coffee breaks with you. After a while, maybe you are start treating me like one of you. And so I'm observing from within instead of from outside. Um, and, but to be credible, I should behave like you. I should speak like you. So I should learn to do your work. Because otherwise, you know, I would not be accepted in the group as a, as a peer, as a colleague. Okay, it's not disguising, okay? I'm not in disguise trying to, hey, is this a new colleague? No, I, 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 it's clear that I will be an observer, but uh, as an observer, I will try to work with you on the same activities as you, and so I, I probably need to get the training that you have for that task and so on. And in the 
in this context, it's much easier to see the practice and uh, get the, the suggestions, okay? Imagine when, if any of you maybe, not, maybe in this period it was difficult to go on stage uh, in a company, but when you're there, they will tell you a lot of uh, information about what to do, how to do that, which is not written in the books or in the instruction or anywhere. That kind of information you can only get if you are one of them. Hmm? Um, and of course, it would be also easier you know, to validate obser your observation directly. We are chatting with them, you're sitting with them, you're going to the coffee with them. Okay, so just tell me what you did there because I didn't understand. Can you explain me how to do it or whatever? You just can try to make it come natural. Hmm? So there are two opposite strategies. There are maybe hundreds of other states. In, in between or other alternative, but just to understand that we, depending on the type of users and the type of task, uh, we can uh, organize our observation in a different way. Hmm? And uh, what data should be collected? So at the end of the observation, what, do, what should we have in, my, in, in our hands? Of course, we have a lot of information in our head because we observe, we thought, we, we remember, but it needs to be, especially if you have a group of people that are doing the observation, we need to be able to share some information in a structured way. Okay? So, what should we write down? What do we get? There will be some subjective information, which is important. The impression, I feel that this is going to be a difficult point for them. Uh, I may have some impressions that are given directly by the users. Because when the users understand that you are there for helping them, they will start complaining. They will start telling stories. They will start to relate with you and say, let's say express the, their, their pain points or their funny stories, or their uh, support stories. I, just, I try to ask for help, but they never reply or whatever, okay? I open a ticket with the secretary, they don't reply after three weeks, I cannot, uh, we know a lot of the stories from you, for example. We, if we just listen, the key is just listen. And, uh, and all this information you can collect. Maybe you can also ask for some evaluation. Okay, which is better for you? How much do you like this? Solution without, with this other one. Okay, always talking about their experience. People are always happy to talk about their life, about their own. Just don't ask them about your system or your features, okay? You will get useless answers. So you can have a report, you can also note what is the strange items, artifacts that you find in the, work, in the workplace. Physical objects, a post-it in the, in the, um, on, on, the, on the desk, for example, or on the screen of the computer, or in the drawer of their desk, we have a post-it. That's important, because some information that they need to have and it is hidden in the place, uh, and so we ask ourselves, why do they need this information? Can we do without? And we also may also have some objective information. Okay, anecdotes are partly objective and partly subjective, because when you're telling a story, you're, also, you're always painting it with brighter colors, okay? But, okay, they are, they report actual, real facts. Or critical incident, what did happen? Oh, I remember three months ago, that Friday evening, we went, we stayed here until midnight because, okay, tell me what happened. Maybe it's relevant, maybe not, okay? But it's information that we can use to understand the user. The, the errors that you, that you observe, maybe you see a person that takes a long way to do a job, or maybe they do something wrong and they have to correct it. 
this is, a, is very important information because it's where we can work to reduce the error rate or the workaround. Okay, they know that this is not going to work, so they find different ways of doing that. Um, so this is the kind of information you get by observation. I didn't put any numbers, times or people, because it, it, it depends, it varies, okay? Uh, for a larger project, you are, you are uh, probably wanting to spend more time in observation with a larger group and more representative group of users. I think the, the most difficult part of this task was here in this slide. What is that? Okay, I don't find it, but anyway, uh, breaking the, wall, the organization wall, the organization rule. Being able to contact and to work directly with the final users and setting the managers aside, setting the clients aside, setting the consultants, the marketing aside, to say, okay, I want to talk with the real users. If you get that, then you will get a lot of, it will be easier. Okay, but in uh, official uh, business to business, say, type of settings, you always have someone in front that pretends to know. They are also a bit afraid that somebody really understands what their people are doing. So they try to shield them. Hmm? Not to protect the employees, but to protect themselves. But it's a longer story. Yes, the other question. Uh, no, it, they, they should know that they are being observed. Uh, first, because you are recording them probably, so it's legally required. Uh, but then, yeah. Uh, no, in, no I, I don't think any, any context in which the user should be totally unaware that somebody is evaluating them when the, because it will break the, the trust with their institution or with the, okay, you didn't tell me, or you, so it's better to be clear, okay? It's better to be clear that uh, we are not uh, evaluating their work, we are not evaluating their efficiency, we are not judging them, we, are, we want to learn from them. So I think being honest and transparent is better then try to, because they, they will find that out anyway, okay? So if there's somebody new that looks too much and makes too many questions, uh, it's always suspicious, so they, uh, you, your cover win won't last, okay, <laughs> basically, okay? But it's not, uh, so we know that the, we will influence their behavior, but it's a normal risk, uh, but it's better to be recognized. Even because then maybe during the coffee break or they find you in the parking lot and start telling you stories because they know what is your role. Yeah? Yeah. So the question was, uh, if I try to blend into the wall, Will my presence uh, never be forgotten, as you're saying, okay? So they will always, oh, of course, they will know that you are there, okay? But uh, one th thing is uh, being aware in the background of your mind, uh, what, and okay, you know it's there, but then you are, your, work, your work to do, your phone to reply, and uh, your colleagues to work with, uh, so after a while, you will be focusing your attention on the task and not on this person that is there. And uh, so unless the environment is really toxic, 
where people really feel afraid of what they're doing or, what they're doing or, or how they are being controlled, then it's a different problem. But normally, you just introduce yourself, uh, you explain what you're there for, to do, and they will mind their own business. They just don't mind about me. And uh, they will never forget. In the back of their mind, they know you are there. But after a while, uh, they, don't, they won't care so much. So I, I didn't know you were well, you know, asking in your, in your project here how to approach potential users. Uh, uh, but usually I find that depends on the target users. Of course, you are, if your target users are, you know, the military, uh, then maybe it will, will be more difficult, okay? But if uh, there are normal people, maybe in their work or in a shop or just, exp usually you go there and you explain, uh, Yeah, maybe not 24 hours in a row because you need to go and sleep with them. But uh, yeah, usually you go there and you explain, okay, I'm doing a work for, for the university, I'm doing a project, can we just have a, a watch and st sit in there here and see what they're doing and then we have a talk of half an hour. Mm. People tend to be friendly usually, okay. Of course, let's try to find a target group which are approachable. Hmm? Yes. Uh, okay, so you're asking whether some kind of observation could come through the application, okay? So having metrics in the application and they will tell you, okay, um, this is not proper observation, okay? It's, measure, it's analytics and measurements, uh, but first you are, um, you are assuming that it, you already have an application. So this can only happen if you are trying to improve an existing application with minor changes, okay? So in that case, yes, you can do that. Uh, and it's one, you see some of these techniques at the end of the course of the usability studies where you can, you want to get um, um, hard data about efficiency, about the error rates and stuff like that. But it doesn't give you information about what they want to have and they don't have today. So uh, getting data through the application only lets you improve what is already there. You cannot, it doesn't help you in imagining something new that you maybe want to implement, some new functionality, okay? For that, because, uh, for that you need to observe them from outside the computer, okay? Uh, imagine what kind of uh, understanding of the world you have uh, if you are closed inside the case of a computer. The only thing you can see is from the keyboard and for the mouse what they are doing. So it's a very specific, narrow view. So in this phase of brainstorming, idea creation and so on, it doesn't help so much. Okay. okay. Um, I think... Uh, we don't have time to start. Uh, it's a quick topic, but uh, yes, it's only two slides. Then we go. Um, another possibility we, that requires a bit more collaboration from the users, I just mentioned it because we are not likely to adopt it in this course, is to ask users to take diaries of their activity. So if I'm observing a task only for two weeks, uh, oh sorry, for two hours, it's okay. But if I want to observe a task that lasts uh, weeks and weeks, I cannot be there and live with them for different, many days. So I could ask another alternative, would be asking their collaboration. Can you just, uh, I know I'm observing you. I will come to you once a week. 
For example, we discuss and ask you stuff. In the meantime, could you please write what you are doing related to the domain that we are you know, constructing or playing sport or whatever. So we ask people to take notes. This is an example of a, an experiment we did with some users. We prepared some booklets, uh, nice code and so on. We gave them a pen and said, okay, what that, when this, in this particular case, uh, we asked them, whenever you are doing something in your house that could be automated because it's something that you are repeating, write down the condition and the action. And this could be repeated and this happens every time something else, uh, I'm doing something else. Okay? And we asked them to fill this booklet and we left it there for two weeks. We made an interview before, an interview after, and we got some information. Of course, it requires a lot of collaboration on their side, and that's why you should uh, plan some instances. Okay? So among all the people that responded, we, I, I don't remember if it was a, a wireless speaker or something like that, we had some prize that were awarded by extraction, by random to one, to one of them, uh, because they had to invest some time and some knowledge because they know they may have some chance to win. Maybe just a chocolate box, like Torziano is doing with the students, or, <laughs> or, or some price or something like that. But of course, uh, you should create a relationship with where they are giving and taking at the same time. Okay? So just, to, just a flash uh, to, to say that there are many other different methods of observation that may be more indirect. Okay, I'm stopping here. Uh, so the first half of you will walk uh, to the lab right now. I will be there to open the door and we continue tomorrow morning. Thank you.